despite starting off as a well-mannered and intelligent child, the story of Charles Joseph Whitman, known as the Texas Tower Sniper, took a darker turn, ultimately leading to a shocking event that shook the University of Texas at Austin. You can only imagine what happened when he went to the viewing deck on the 28th floor of the tower and shot randomly for 96 minutes. Well, you want to know what happened? Keep watching this video then. Charles Whitman was born on June 24, 1941 in Lake Worth, Florida. He was the elder of Margaret's three boys. Whitman's dad grew up in an orphanage in Savannah, Georgia, but he called himself a man who made it on his own. She was 17 years old at the time, and he married her in 1940. Whitman's parents' marriage was tense because of domestic violence. Whitman's dad was a tyrant who took care of his family and expected almost perfect behavior from everyone. It was known that he abused his wife and kids physically and emotionally. As a boy, Whitman was described as a polite, well-behaved child who rarely lost his temper. He was also very smart. An IQ test given to him at age six showed that he was 139. His parents pushed him to do well in school, but if he showed signs of failing or being lazy, his father would abuse him physically. Margaret Whitman was a devoted Roman Catholic, and she taught her boys the same faith. The Whitman brothers and their mother went to mass together every week, and all three of them were altar boys at the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church. Whitman Sr. loved guns and collected them. From a very young age, he taught all of his boys how to shoot, clean, and take care of guns. He took them on many hunting trips, and Charles learned to love hunting and shoot well. Charlie could plug the eye out of a squirrel by the time he was 16, his father said. At age 11, Whitman joined the Boy Scouts. He became an Eagle Scout at age 12 years and three months, which was apparently the youngest age of any Eagle Scout at that time. At the same time, he learned to play the piano well. Around the same time, he started a long newspaper route. Whitman started at St. Anne's High School in West Palm Beach on September 1, 1955. He was a moderately popular student, and both his teachers and peers thought of him as smart. By the following month, he had saved enough money from his newspaper route to buy a Harley Davidson, which he used on his route. Whitman joined the Marine Corps one month after graduating from high school in June 1959, where he came in seventh out of 72 students. He didn't tell his father about it ahead of time. Whitman told a family friend that the breaking point was when, a month earlier, his father beat him and threw him into the family pool because Whitman had come home drunk. Whitman left home on July 6 for an 18-month tour with the Marines at Guantanamo Bay. His dad still didn't know he joined the Army. While Whitman was on his way to Paris Island, his father found out about what he was doing and called a federal government office, but was not successful in getting his son's membership canceled. He won the Marine Corps Expeditionary Medal and the Sharpshooter's Badge during his first 18 months of service in 1959 and 1960. On tests of his shooting skills, he got 215 out of a possible 250 points. He did well when shooting quickly over long distances and at moving targets. When Whitman was done with his work, he applied to a U.S. Navy and Marine Corps grant program with the goal of going to college and getting a commission. Whitman did well on the required test, and the selection committee gave him permission to attend a preparatory school in Maryland. He did well in math and physics classes there and then he was allowed to transfer to the University of Texas to study mechanical engineering. On September 15, 1961, Whitman started a new course in mechanical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. At first, he wasn't doing well in school and got mostly average grades. Not long after he started college, he and two friends were caught stealing a deer. 
a bystander wrote down Whitman's number plate number and called the police. When they were caught, the three were killing the deer in the shower at Whitman's dorm. Whitman was fined $100 for the crime. As an engineering student, Whitman was known for pulling practical jokes on people. But his friends also said that he said some scary and dark things. In 1962, Whitman and a friend named Francis Shuck Jr. were looking through books in the University of Texas main building shop. Whitman said, a person could stand off an army from atop of the tower before they got him. Whitman, then 20 years old, met Kathleen Francis Lesner in February 1962. She was an education major two years younger than him. The first steady girlfriend Whitman had was Leisner. They dated for five months before July 19, when they announced they were getting married. Whitman and Leisner got married in a Catholic ceremony in Needville, Texas, on August 17, 1962. According to records, the wedding took place on the 22nd anniversary of Whitman's parents' wedding. Whitman's family drove down from Florida to Texas to attend the wedding, and his younger brother Patrick was the best man. Leduc, a friend of the Whitman family, led the service. The people close to Leisner liked the choice of husband she made. They called Whitman a handsome young man who was smart and ambitious. Whitman's grades got a little better in his second and third quarters, but the Marines still didn't think they were good enough for him to keep his aid. In February 1963, he was called to active service and spent the rest of his five-year term at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Whitman didn't like that he had to stop going to college, even though he was immediately raised to the rank of Lance Corporal. He had to stay in the hospital for four days at Camp Lejeune after saving another Marine by pulling a Jeep that had rolled over a hill by himself. Even though he was known as a great Marine, he kept gambling. In November 1963, he was found guilty of gaming, usury, having a gun on base, and making threats against another Marine over a $30 loan that he wanted $15 in interest on. He was downgraded from Lance Corporal E3 to Private Eon and given 30 days in jail and 90 days of hard labor for this. Whitman began writing a notebook called Daily Record of C.J. Whitman while he was waiting for his court-martial in 1963. In it, he talked about his daily life in the Marine Corps and his relationships with Kathy and other family members. Besides writing about his upcoming court-martial, he also wrote about how much he disliked the Marine Corps and how inefficient they were. Whitman often wrote about his wife in glowing terms and talked about how much he missed being with her. He also talked about how he was trying to get away from relying on his father for money. Whitman was released from the Marines with honor in December 1964. He went back to the University of Texas at Austin and started the program for architectural engineering. He was working as a bill collector for the Standard Finance Company to raise money for himself and Kathy. After that, he worked at the Austin National Bank as a teller. Whitman got a brief job as a traffic surveyor for the Texas Highway Department in January 1965. He also served as a scout leader while his wife Kathy taught biology at Lanier High School. Later, Whitman's friends said that he had told them that he had hit his wife twice. They said that Whitman felt terrible about this and admitted that he was afraid of being like his father. Whitman wrote about his actions in his journal and promised to be a good husband instead of abusive like his father. Margaret Whitman told everyone in May 1966 that she was divorcing her husband because he kept hitting her. Whitman drove to Florida to help his mother move down to Austin. Whitman reportedly called a police officer to stay outside the house while his mother packed her things because he was afraid that his father would physically attack his mother as she got ready to leave. Whitman's youngest brother also left Lake Worth and moved to Austin with his mother. The third son, Patrick Whitman, stayed in Florida and worked in his dad's plumbing supply business. 
In Austin, Whitman's mother got a job in a cafeteria and moved into her own apartment, but she kept in touch with Charles. Whitman's father later said that he had spent more than $1,000 on long distance calls to both his wife and Charles, pleading with his wife to come back and asking his son to persuade her to do so. During this stressful time, Whitman started abusing amphetamines and started getting severe headaches, which made things worse. Whitman went to a hardware shop and bought binoculars and a knife the day before the killings. He also went to a 7-Eleven and bought Spam. He picked up his wife from her summer job as a phone operator and then went to the Wyatt Cafeteria near the university to meet his mother for lunch. Charles and Kathy Whitman went to see their good friends John and Fran Morgan on July 31, 1966. At 5.50 p.m., they left the Morgan's flat so Kathy could get to her from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. shift. Whitman started writing his suicide note at 6.45 p.m. Part of it said, That being said, I'm not sure what is making me type this letter. It could be to leave some kind of hazy explanation for what I did lately. These days, I don't really understand myself. I'm supposed to be a normal, smart, and sensible young man. But lately, I can't remember when it started. I've been having a lot of strange and illogical thoughts. These thoughts keep coming back, and it's very hard to focus on jobs that are useful and move things forward. Continuing with his note, he asked that an autopsy be done on his body after he was dead to see if there was a clear medical cause for his actions and for his headaches that were getting worse over time. In his writing, he also said that he was going to kill his mother and wife. Even though he wasn't sure why he did what he did, he said that he didn't think his mother had ever enjoyed life as she is entitled to and that his wife had been as fine a wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. Whitman also said that he wanted to save his wife and mother from the pain of this world and from having to deal with the shame of his actions. He didn't say anything about making plans for the attack at the college. On August 1, just after midnight, Whitman drove to 1212 Guadalupe Street, which is where his mother lived. He killed his mother, then put her body on her bed and covered it with sheets. There are different opinions on how he killed his mother, but police think he knocked her out and then stabbed her in the heart. He left a note next to her body that was written by hand and said, Please be advised that I have just killed my mother. I'm really upset about what I did, but I'm sure that if there is a heaven, she is there now. I'm truly sorry. Please know that I love this woman with all my heart. He then went back to his house at 906 Jewel Street and killed his wife by stabbing her three times in the heart while she was sleeping. He put sheets over her body and then picked up the typed note he had started the night before. He wrote at the side of the page with a ballpoint pen. Whitman continued the note and signed it with a pen. I think it looks like I killed both of my loved ones very badly. I was only trying to get the job done quickly and well. If my life insurance policy is still good, please pay off my debts and give the rest to a mental health organization without giving my name. Could a study help stop more deaths like this? Give our dog to my in-laws. Tell them that Kathy loved Shoshi a lot. If you can make my last wish come true, bury me in a plot of land after the autopsy. It was also left in the rented house with orders to develop two rolls of film and he sent personal notes to each of his brothers. Whitman last wrote on an envelope that was marked thoughts for the day. He kept a bunch of written advice in that envelope. On the outside of the package, he wrote, I was never able to make it. I can't handle these thoughts. At 5.45 a.m., Whitman called his wife's boss at Bell System on August 1, 1966, to let her know that Kathy was sick and couldn't work that day. Five hours later, he called his mother's place of work and said the same thing. Whitman's last diary entries were written in the past tense, 
which makes it seem like he had killed his mother and wife already. Around 11, 35 a.m., Whitman arrived at the University of Texas campus in Austin. He told a security guard he was a research assistant when he wasn't and that he was there to deliver some equipment. He then climbed to the 28th floor of the University of Texas Tower and used a hunting rifle and other weapons to start shooting from the viewing deck. Whitman killed 17 people and hurt 31 in the 96 minutes before cops shot and killed him. At that time, several citizens helped the police by firing their own weapons to keep the fighting from getting worse. Even though Whitman was on prescription drugs and had dexedrine with him when he died, a lab test wasn't done right away because his body had already been embalmed on August 1 after being taken to the Cook Funeral Home in Austin. But Whitman asked for an autopsy in the notes he left before he killed himself, and his father agreed. An autopsy was done at the funeral home on August 2 by Dr. Shinar, a neuropathologist at Austin State Hospital. Urine and blood samples were taken to look for signs of amphetamines or other drugs. During the autopsy, Shinar found a brain tumor the size of a nut, which he called an astrocytoma, and which had some necrosis. Shinar came to the conclusion that Whitman's deeds were not affected by the tumor. Further, the Connolly Commission changed its mind and said, it is the opinion of the task force that the relationship between the brain tumor and Charles J. Whitman's actions on the last day of his life cannot be established with clarity. Governor John Connolly of Texas asked a task group to look into the autopsy results and other information about Whitman's acts and the reasons for them. Neurosurgeons, therapists, pathologists, psychologists, and John White and Maurice Heatley, who run the University of Texas Health Center, were on the board. The commission had concluded that Shinar's finding had been in error following a three-hour hearing on August 5. Psychiatric contributors to the report concluded that the relationship between the brain tumor and Whitman's actions cannot be established with clarity. However, the tumor conceivably could have contributed to his inability to control his emotions and actions. Some forensic scientists think the tumor may have been pressing on Whitman's amygdala, a brain area linked to fear and the fight or flight response. On August 5, 1966, Whitman and his mother were both laid to rest at a Catholic burial service in Lake Worth, Florida. They were laid to rest in Hillcrest Memorial Park in Florida. Whitman was buried with military honors and the American flag was placed over his coffin because he had been in the service. Did you think the tumor could have an influence on his decisions? Let's hear your thoughts in the comments section. If you'd like to see more videos like this, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.